Well, hi, and welcome to the Strom Entrepreneurial Center. My name is Patrick Mullins, and uh, this is a series of uh, conversations about innovation in the arts, both in distribution, creation, process, um, and how folks are doing that. And today we have with us um, uh, Matt Ciso, who is uh, an amazing painter. Hi, Matt. And uh, hello, hello. he wasn't. Yeah. Let me tell you a little about Matt and then I'll let him tell you about himself because obviously he's the expert on him. Um, but Matt wasn't always a painter. Uh, he discovered his passion um, in 1994 while he was working at IBM. And he eventually left his career in computers to become a full time artist. By his estimate, he sold more than 17,000 works due to his emotional, joyful, and in his words, obsessive painting. Um, he paints in an outsider art style that always uses story, consistently uses um, iconography. And his work's highly influenced by um, some really great 80s artists, including John Michael Basquiat, and I'm sure he'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but folks who rose to fame for their bold and colorful artworks. But he's a full-time painter, and he lives in Washington, D.C., and he's been painting and on the web since 1994, Matt Ciso. Hello. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll give you a hand. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> well, it's good to have you, Matt. Um, maybe uh, you could tell us a little bit about your journey. We can just start there because you you have a very, uh, very fascinating story. Oh, thank you. Um, all right. I, I guess uh, for painting, I started in uh, 1994, like you said. Uh, I was working at IBM at the time here in the D.C. area. And just on a fluke one night, I was at a group house here in D.C. And there was a, a you know bunch of fellow people, my, I call them kids, but actually I was an adult. I was 28 at the time. So we're all about the same age. But um, a few of them had gone to art school and they were sitting around at a table painting and stuff. And they, they asked me if I had ever painted and I was trying to be cool. So I lied and said, yes. I mean, you know, I messed around in high school, I guess, and probably elementary school. But um, so I just kind of, kind of, you know, made it up as I went along that night. And uh, I just stuck with it after that. I realized when I started painting that, first of all, I was probably mostly influenced by music and a lot of the, the flyers for shows that I would like to go see here in DC. This was, I guess, in the yeah early 90s. Um, so I was trying to like represent a lot of that um, emotion and politics. And I would use really, you know, sharp color or bright colors and sharp lines. And um, yeah, so I just started painting after that night, uh, kept, you know, when I would go back there, they would be, if they were working on art, I would do it uh, with them. And then usually what happens after they would quit for the night, I'd keep going. <laughs> um, and what happened eventually is I, I had a lot of little, you know, little paintings and laying around that house. And um, when they'd have parties, I would put my paintings up on the wall in, in 1994. And like people would come by and I'd like sell them for like 10 bucks or 20 bucks to people. So I realized that there was a little bit of interest there. Um, and then the other main thing that I, the subject matter was painting at the time was uh, a reflection of my, um, my physical disability. Um, when I was eight, I got hit by an airplane in Nebraska, which is not a very common thing to happen <laughs> for anyone. <laughs> um, and that, re that resulted in them having to amputate my hand. Um, so there was, a, and it was kind of like, you know, I guess a Nebraska or Midwest kind of thing, you know, I'll just brush it off and get back out there. So there wasn't really a lot of discussion about what happened to me or I, you know, I never really talked about it with anyone. And you just kind of live, live life, played sports, went to college, stuff like that. Um, so what happened was when I started painting, I started to maybe focus on the disability or do a little self-portrait type things, uh, trying to communicate some emotional um, feelings, that, you know, responses or emotions I've had that I hadn't really ever articulated. Um, and that's when it really took off. I, I just really, really started to get into the painting that way. Um, and it's very emotional and, um, I'll just, I'll skip just a little bit around here. But then in 1996, when I uh, was just out around Georgetown, um, I asked this group that was holding an art fair if I could just show some of my paintings. And they let me. And that was the first day I ever tried to sell my work. It was like in a kind of like a, a doorway of a, of a business along the streets of um, Wisconsin Avenue in Georgetown. And I was about ready to give up for the day because I hadn't sold one painting. It was just kind of like a you know fluke. And I was like, well, this is, this is dumb. 
um, I'll go back to programming. <laughs> no, I mean, that's what I was doing full time anyways. But um, and at the end, uh, a woman came up to me who was visiting her son in D.C., who lived in D.C., and she kind of she kind of flipped out and she said, oh, my God, what is this? Who are you? And told her my story and everything. And she pretty much brought bought every painting that day before I left and um, ended up she was an art agent in the outsider art folk art world. And she um, signed me onto like a five year contract the next week to represent me. So it's kind of a you know fairy tale story. <laughs> First time I ever tried to sell it, it was, it was gangbusters. And um, so that, yes, then I had an agent for the first five years while I was uh, working at IBM. Um, That's a then, lot of uh, unique strikes of luck <laughs> in all sorts yeah. of directions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and the funny thing is, is I, I admit it to my wife, Dan, a lot sometimes. I mean, because what else am I gonna say? But a lot of times I go, you know, it was kind of a good deal that I got hit by that airplane, you know, because <laughs> it gave me this this unique story, this unique life. You know, I mean, it was tragic for people to see it and you know, you know, to go through all that stuff. But but I think there was something about I was able to take it and, and quote unquote use it to to tell right. the story through my paintings and and have a unique story. Um, and I think that's you know trauma and struggle that's sometimes can you know point you in a direction that you normally wouldn't wouldn't have taken. No, it's fodder for many artists. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about how your life is now, and then we can talk about how you got from being an IBM programmer to where you are now. But okay. maybe tell us a little um, bit about what your life is now. You've got your, your studio and your wife, and yeah. you, you've got a pretty idyllic life, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy. We, we live downtown. Um, it's an 800-square-foot apartment condo. Um, sleep in a bunk bed. I've been sleeping in a bunk bed since I was, I think, about 29. I'm 55 now, so, so a lot. My parents are very proud. Um, and um, so this half of the apartment is where I paint. And then Dan and my wife, she's on the other side of these bookcases that's kind of like this artificial wall. And she paints over there. And then we have a bedroom. Um, so pretty much every day, wake up. I try to run every other day. So I, I really try to keep fit as possible. Um, and then I just, you know, depending on whether somebody wants me to paint something for them through a commission or I have a, a show coming up or I just wanna you know, paint whatever's on my head. I pretty much get to do that every day now. Um, and the way, we, the way we work our, so our business now, we're, we're married, so we count it as like kind of two different businesses. So it's the map business and the Dana business. Um, and we just pretty much paint and sell online. And then once a week, go to the post office. And if, if we have a really good week, we'll be shipping around 30 paintings a week. Uh, but typical, typical week, I'd say I probably sell now on average about one one painting a day, which is which is pretty good, one to two. So um, it's really pretty much that. And I I like to you know try to always come up with new ideas. Um, for example, tomorrow I'm going to be doing a live painting on YouTube um, from 11 a.m. Eastern to to 3 p.m. and anybody can watch that. Um, and I, I'll type, I can type the, the link in the chat or something, but, or tell you, or you can just go to, um, sure. I think it's life.ciso.com. There'll be a little window there for it. But anyways, uh, just always trying to come up with new things. And, um, you know, it's, 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 we get up like at five or 6 a.m. every day and go to bed at eight. I mean, it's, it's not the like, you know, fancy, fancy art life that maybe you see in the movies anymore. Cause the, the idea now is to, is to prolong the art life as long as possible, not to, you know, burn out or to, you know, get too wild and, and crash. Um, Cause like I said, I've been doing this, I guess, 27 years now. And, I, wow. and I, when I started out, I was definitely wild. I mean, when I was started out, I was, you know, trying to be as intense or crazy as possible with the art and push myself as hard as possible. And now with all the, those sales, like, you know, the 17,000 or whatever, it's, um, it's given me a lot of foundation, a very solid foundation uh, to I have a lot of collectors that I can, you know, kind of as long as I keep them aware that I'm doing new things, it, it's just kind of a self-feeding monster now. <laughs> the art. That's that's a really fascinating thing. I watched another interview with you where you were talking about because you were coming from computer land that you built a, a very early website when people weren't really doing that yet. And and you had an email list before long before MailChimp and all that stuff. Um yeah. 
So maybe we could veer into that story of how you went from IBM to full time. Sure. Yeah. So one of the jobs I had, so IBM was the first job. And then after that, I also worked for places like AOL. I worked at Netscape um, in Silicon Valley. Uh, but at AOL, that's, they made it pretty easy to start a website. I think it's like probably around 1996. So I was, you know, using a lot of that ability that I had because I was, you know, pretty much I was working in you know, programming and testing at a, at a major web company. Um, so what I, I remember, my website now is pretty much the same uh, code and structure I, I used in 97. It's, it's, I, think, I think I started this site, this site maybe 96, 97, but I remember what I did originally is I took the Guinness beer site and I viewed the source code for what they had done. And then I, you know, of course, backwards engineered to make it into my site. Um, so I, I did a lot of, you know, copy paste to see how other people were using JavaScript and HTML and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so now when I when I do a, a new painting, um, I take a picture of it um, and post it up, and I do the HTML code. That's all raw coding. I don't I don't like drag drop stuff. It's it's all uh, it's all um, you know code. Um, although now I'm starting to use some tools for other sites because it's a lot easier. <laughs> uh, and then, oh, and when I first started painting too, there weren't digital cameras. So in the in the early, late '90s, mid '90s. I used to make some short films using my Mac and VHS tape. So in order to get a, an image of my painting on the, on my new website, I'd have to shoot it with a video camera and then pause it um, on, you know, the, while it was playing the video of my painting or whatever, pause it. And then I had the I had video capture software that <laughs> could take frames and stuff. So that's how I did it back in the old days. A lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> that is well um as you as you crossed over through this journey maybe talk about how did money work for that did you did you have a nest egg from programming land that helped you jump in or how, yeah. how did how did you navigate that life change yeah the 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 key i think to all of this is um i'm notoriously cheap i mean i i hardly ever spend money my wife will tell you that too but um so what I did is I I bought a condo when I moved to when I moved to Washington D.C. Um, a little I guess 500 square foot place, so very inexpensive in a in a neighborhood that nobody wanted to live in at the time. Now of course you know it's probably worth a lot more. But um, so what I did is I made sure I had my property bought. Um, I don't have a didn't, I still don't have a car. I haven't had a car since I guess 97 or 98. Um, you know, never had cell phone cable, all that kind of stuff. I just always was taking pretty much all my money and saving it. Um, even at IBM, I mean, I was like eating rice for frozen, you know, like I'd make rice on Sunday and bring it in, in five different little, you know, packets throughout the week. Um, so I pretty much just never spent money. Um, and then once I realized I want to be a painter, I kind of took it into overdrive um, and just you know, everything went to paint. Um, and let's see what else. I mean, it's kind of like, it, yeah, it was like an attitude almost like, because a lot of the music I love is that you know, punk rock stuff from the 80s and 90s or hardcore, or whatever. And the idea there was always value for money. The idea is like, you go see a show, it's only going to cost you five bucks to get in. And you're getting, you know, now, of course, that's impossible. But back in the days, you could do that. Um, and I always wanted to do that with my art. I wanted to make, imagery that was not i mean primitive fast edgy but also very affordable and also maybe even better than what you would get from some hot shot out of art school selling their work for you know eight thousand um, dollars okay. so that was always the idea too was almost like against the system in a way like anti-gallery in a way even though I've, I've worked with a lot of galleries over the years although i don't try to do that anymore but um th that's like a necessary evil that you have to you have to work work with the within the business structure of the gallery system in order to kind of you know get known and all that kind of stuff. But um, I don't know. I mean, and, you know, I can get into like, you know, let's say my business. I pay taxes every every quarter. You know, I keep all the books very very simple. And, um, you know, it's it's all part of the business. And and I kind of took my IBM skills or programming skills and and use that for the art. In other words, like every 
project has a schedule, there's checkpoints. Um, you know, if I'm if I have to create a hundred paintings for a show, I make sure that I'm you know on schedule to do that. Um, you know, answer email. Yeah, it's it's the the business side is probably sixty percent of it of it now, um, just to keep on top of stuff. Um, the painting's kind of the easy part. Uh, well, you often refer to your work as being outsider work, which I, you know, kind of re refers to style, but, you know, also your attitude toward galleries, which is, um, is fascinating. So do you think of galleries as like a marketing system almost like, is it part of your marketing scheme? If that makes sense? Yeah, it's, I think, I mean, a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of galleries or most galleries nowadays, I guess. They take 50% of your sales. So let's say these little doggy painting behind me, if I charge, I don't know, 800 bucks for that, and that's 800 bucks that my customers or people that buy my work are used to paying. So if I have a gallery show, I only get 400 for that when it sells. And a lot of times now that I've been doing this for so long, like let's say a, a gallery that is relatively new, I mean, I, I can tell, 30,000 people about this gallery show and what's happening is I'm bringing kind of my 27 years of experience into this gallery that's only been around one or two years and they might they might get me you know 15 people at an opening so in the beginning it does make sense you get you kind of have to do the gallery shows you have to give up 50 percent but the advice I try to give new um, artists is don't just don't price your work too high because that the gallery you're working with they're not going to be around in two or three years like they they come and go all the time and they're going to convince every kid at art school that they're the next picasso um so you know i i, I know people here in dc you know they're charging ten thousand dollars for something and i'm like you're, you know you're gonna have an inventory problem especially if you if you do a lot of work and you have like if i charge ten thousand for this i'm gonna have like you know ten thousand of these babies laying around this apartment it's not big enough so the the trick is i do what i love i love to paint so I want to move it out. I want to move it out. And, you know, I, I, I price it so that it, 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 it leaves here. Um, luckily, the shipping systems, like with the postal system and UPS, FedEx, they're, they're very reliable now. I mean, I know yeah. they get a lot of bad rap, but, but you can really inexpensively ship stuff all around the world now. Like I, I ship all over the world um, and haven't lost a painting yet. It's amazing of all those. That's... um. That's that's amazing. Uh, what? And I will say, you know, I went to your website and spent some time there. And um, yeah, for what people go to some big box store or, you know, decor store, they can get a much more interesting piece that's that's yours. I think what's fascinating about that, though, is that you've built a lifestyle that you like. You know, most of us are like, oh, I've got to have this job to do this. And I'm and, and you you've really focused on what do I do that brings me joy every day. There, yeah. there was another interview where you talked a lot about that. And I think you linked it back to music actually and video games and the things that kind of gave you a tingle and, and, yeah. and that you gravitated toward those things. C can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So um, the video game thing is, is I guess fairly interesting. So I was, I was telling you before that, um, when I was 13 or 14, I detasseled corn in Nebraska. So that's a job where you would walk down the field and pull the tassels off of, I guess it's seed corn. I, don't, I can't remember, but, um, but I really wanted an Atari 2600. This is like back in, I don't know, what, 70 or 80. I know it's probably like 81 or something. But um, anyways, I took that money and I bought a, a little video game system. Um, and I, the color system, if you look at, I guess those are 8-bit, right? The old days. Um, uh -huh. Very blocky colors, very bright primaries. And I think that really affected my art a lot because I always remember playing games like Breakout and you know, like the Space Invader. And they would the, the colors are just weird how they always would mix. And I, I, I there's something about that I really enjoyed. Um, and then while playing my games, I would listen to music on eight track tapes, believe it or not. Um, you know, like, like <laughs> probably rock back in the days, like the pretenders or something like that. But um, yeah, I would just spend like, you know, eight hours or not eight hours, probably like 
three hours playing, you know, Space Invaders or something. It's con just ridiculous games back in the day. Um, so the idea of like happiness in life and making it this way, I, I think, I, I, I want to jump ahead a little bit before I go back to music, but the idea of, of doing what you love, um, I, I love programming at the beginning. I mean, I pretty much taught myself how to do all the, I mean, a lot of it, a lot of what I learned in college, but um, it, it was fun, but then it kind of lost, lost the, the fun and the thrill once I started to do it from, you know, like real money and, and a job and being told what to do and when to do it. Um, so I think the key was to paint simultaneously at the same time while I was working, because I had this, I had the steady income. I could take risk with money a little bit more because I knew I was getting a paycheck every two weeks. So I was able to buy really good quality paint. I was able to travel if I, you know, needed to, or I could buy an ad in a magazine. I don't think people do that anymore, but maybe they do. Um, but I could spend money on marketing. Um, in college, my minor was business. So I think that helped me a lot to marketing classes. Um, so anyways, I knew, I knew I didn't want to really be a corporate person once I got into painting anymore. Uh, once I got into painting, I didn't want to be corporate so much anymore. So, so I kind of set my goal. Like it used to be maybe over here. And I realized that's eh, kind of boring over here. I want to go over here now. So I just switched my whole focus, even though I still played along in the corporate world, I always knew I was going to be over here. And um, so by saving money and, you know, hitting when the, when the time was right. I remember the, after I left my last job, and that was in Georgetown too. It was a, it was a web design. I was a tester at a web design company and they laid me off. And I remember being in there and they were like, oh, you know, like they're all nervous. Oh, we're going to have to lay you off now. We're so sorry. And I go, thank you. I go, thank you. So on my walk back to my place in Adams Morgan, I stopped into this little gallery record store place. And I said, can I just have a solo show here? They said, sure. So <laughs> I, I wasn't even back before I'd gone full-time art. I was like, I, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with programming. So at least for, for a job. Um, but that took me, that took me a good seven, eight years where I was working corporate. Um, and then about, and then simultaneously, probably, I guess, four or five years. Um, and, and now I'm, I'm really happy with, with this life. Um, it's, it's still, it's still work, but it's mostly play. Um, and then back to the music thing again. So when I, when I came to DC, I was really, amazed at the music scene i love to go you know to the usual clubs everybody talks about and see the bands um and uh it was just really a neat positive experience very creative i always thought the people on stage were magic you know how did it, how do they come up with this stuff it's so good it's so amazing and i i don't have any musical talent i i don't think and um so i wanted some way to maybe express myself the way i, I saw the you know like the music i in a way this is I guess similar because we we talk about like Basquiat, he was also working in music. Um, mm -hmm. Like Andy Warhol, he was right. working with um, Velvet Underground and Nico, things like that. So I um, I don't know. I think that there is a there is a nice nice connection between music and painting, um, more so than than uh, music and programming. <laughs> Although nowadays I think all you need is a laptop and you probably got a band. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. Which is a what, um, bad thing. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you do use your time now? As far as you said, about 60% of your work is more, you know, the administration of business and then mm -hmm. the other 40%. Can you talk a little bit about how that works and your trip to the post office once a week? Like, yeah. what, how does that, what's the rhythm of that? So let's say I did some, like, so these are, some paintings over the shoulder that I worked on last night a little bit this morning. So I'm going to probably post those later today. So last night I painted and worked on these or yesterday during the whole day. And um, so I'll take, I'll take a digital image of these. Um, maybe, maybe I'll sell one of them today. Maybe not, whatever. But so over the week leading up, so behind me, behind the, this dog painting, there's a drawing rack. So on there, as I as I finish, you know, wet paintings, I'll put them in there. Um, and then I have a sold pile. So as the week goes along, they sell. So they stack up in there. Um, 
so when I put the painting on the website, um, somebody emails me. So pretty much there's an email link right next to my, to the painting thumbnail. Uh, people email me, they say, hey, I wanna buy it. I write back right away and tell them the different ways they can pay. So Venmo, Zelle, PayPal, credit card, check, all the usual stuff. Um, I used to do Bitcoin. I haven't done that in a while, but um, <laughs> probably probably should go back to that. I don't know. Everybody's talking about it. Um, <laughs> and uh, so make the sale. Once I get paid, then I'll put a sold sign on the on the um, the web page. Usually people pay right away, so it's usually the same day. Um, so the sold sign goes up. Then I put the painting in the the stack with the other. So like I think. Um, usually we do it on Fridays. So Dan and I will, will wake up on Friday. We'll package the painting. So we keep cardboard throughout the week. You know, all this all the stuff we get from Amazon. We live in a condo, so a lot of our neighbors are throwing card you know boxes away in the trash mm -hmm. room. So I'll, we have like a whole, I have a whole stack of like cardboard um, that I can use for packaging. We have tubes that we buy or we recycle tubes that we find. Um, so anyways, we'll spend about. I don't know, four hours packing, maybe five on Friday. And then after that, we'll um, walk down to the post office, which is right next to, um, it's the, the main post office here in DC, but it's next to Trump Tower. So it's, we're really close. We're like two blocks from that. Um, and then, or we'd go to the White House. That's a really good post office by the White House. Um, and yeah, pretty much that's it. You know, I have just a, a business credit card. That's where all the business stuff goes. So I bring my business credit card with me to the post office. We pretty much have a, a, a name, first name basis almost with every postal person we work because we've been doing this for so long, you know, like, oh, here's more paintings. Um, and, you know, I try to send everything first class um, if it's light enough, because that's, that's, I get a tracking number for first class now. That's, that's a nice feature. If I have something to send overseas, I fill out the custom forms online on my on my laptop before I take it to the post office. I fill out the custom form, print it out here. Got a really nice laser printer. Laser printers last forever. They're really super cheap. Um, and or we do a priority mail if it's if it's too heavy. And then larger large paintings, if they're like 30 inches by 40 inches, like like this one behind me, or larger, you have to send those UPS <clears throat> or FedEx. Um, and uh yeah i mean that, and that's just that's friday and then maybe go grocery shopping to stock up on food and beer <laughs> um we were talking before we started about uh oops sorry we were talking before you started about uh about video games and how that's they're they're still part of your process um how does that work yeah so um so I'm, where i'm sitting right now above me is a is a tv and my xbox um <laughs> yeah so as i as i paint here in the wall um so like if i'm waiting for a layer to dry because if i'm using acrylic oil takes forever to dry but if i'm using acrylic i'll maybe run a fan i have a fan on the other side of the room that blows on the wall all, all day um so i'll wait for that to dry I'll, I'll have my xbox on and i'll just you know sit and play for you know like 20 minutes hopefully hopefully not too much longer <laughs> but sometimes i i might go over um and yeah, I mean, it just, it gives me like, it, it's a relaxed thing, but also, which is so great about Xbox, I guess, and PlayStation's also is kind of, get, you have achievements with, I don't know, uh -huh. if you, I'm sure a lot of people are aware of this, but so it's kind of like you can set little goals. Like it, it is like a human thing, I think, or maybe just a me thing. I love to like achieve. I love to like, okay, I did 10 paintings today. That's achievement. And I got them on the website or I, or I, you know, beat the, wizard or whatever the heck i'm playing yeah who knows but but it's that idea of of a of a feeling of accomplishment that's why i also run i run like like i said like pretty much every other day i get to run on the mall down here in dc it's lovely very very fortunate and um and that's an accomplishment like now i'm able to run you know, like uh, six miles without walking like that's that's a huge you know i used to be able to do that when i was younger and didn't run for a while now but now i've been running again i'm able to run further and i, I like I like achievement i like to you know, it's just like always, always moving forward. Um, and the painting definitely gives me that. Whereas like when I was a programmer or a tester in software, you know, you get a paycheck. That, I mean, it's always the same kind of reward or, or oh, good job. You get a, a promotion. <laughs> um, oh, a great story about promotion at the, at the IBM job is I went to go see Black Flag. They're like this great punk band. And here in DC, 
it was like on a Wednesday night, you know, it's like, oh, it's probably eight bucks or something. And, and, <laughs> and I remember, I remember going, uh, going back to work and my ears were ringing so bad. Cause it was like awesome. And I was, I could barely hear it. My boss called me into his office and he's like, and my ears are just ringing. I'm wearing a suit and, um, and a tie. And um, he goes, he goes, Matt, I, I'm thinking of moving on and I'm going to nominate you for my job. And I was like, oh, great. And I was just thinking about last night, like, the night before, I was just like, oh, I want that. I want, I want to be on stage. I want to do that. I want to, I want to scream. I want to yell. I want to play. And that, that was a real interesting. I was like, oh, do I really want this? <laughs> the work. Do I really want to be a computer guy? So that, that was kind of fun. That's amazing. Well, it's, you talked about, you know, the nine to five. And I, I think we have this, this is kind of a friction at my house. Um, I'm a theater producer. So there's always 25 people schedules and I'm always working within their time blocks. Um, whereas he's a visual artist. He has his studio. He kind of has his achievement fetish like you do. He has his uh, weekly UPS, you know, send out. And, uh, and so he'll be like, well, can't you just skip that? Or, you know, we just, it, which is, which is great. But you've really, you know, th there's a lot to admire there that you're connected to your impulses enough to not, you know, most of us actually fight our impulses so that we can fit in the square. And instead, uh, it seems like you've incentivized yourself to achieve and you've taken those endorphin cycles and all those <laughs> trauma cycles, all those things that we all carry, and you've hacked them to serve you and give you the life you want. And um, that's just freaking cool. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it is one of the things I think to growing up, you know, realizing like I, when I am walking around, I never think I look different or hold myself different, but I, I do have one hand. And if I see somebody with one hand, I'm like, oh my gosh, he has one hand. And I realized <laughs> that I've always looked different. I've always had to kind of like compensate or do things maybe a little differently and comedy is a big way to handle it too like you know not just me but I always I really like comedy I like like kind of like you know let's you know haha -ha, let's let's move on like I, I don't like to live wallowing in my condition all the time like and I think that there's a saying once again back to black flag Mr. Henry Rollins I think I heard him say it I'm sure I don't know if it's his quote or not or if he got it from somebody but the best revenge for anyone, like any enemy of yours is to succeed. So success is the best way, you know, to, to get back at somebody or to prove them wrong is just be successful. Yeah. And I've really, really taken that to heart. And, and I wanted to, to kind of use what have always has always made me different as an advantage rather than a disadvantage or a disability. Cause I, and, I, and I've, I've, had some conversations with you know some veterans who maybe come back from you know war with with less um than they left with and 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 they're like one was like oh do you think i should go to art school and stuff i said i don't know about art school but you should at least paint or or do art and tell your story because you have such a unique experience that no yeah. you know other people don't have that might just be going through you know life i mean we all have something that we can bring to the table that maybe we have always thought might is negative but you can switch it and maybe use it positively somehow or and i and i'm not saying like you know if you have like some super huge trauma not to like you know throw it out there and go oh yeah but through art a lot of times i say especially with painting you can you can be subtle you don't have to you can be abstract about a story too like i i love to when i first started i was painting about people that pissed me off and that had, you know <laughs> said terrible things to me growing up or whatever and I would put them in the painting but you would never know but it was it was there that energy and I was like ah I got it out of me and then eventually I'm able to sleep better and you know I like, get happier and I think that was really been the great gift of, of art and um, you know I, I I don't I don't know if people should necessarily be putting things on their art with their art that's so easy for others to translate like make it hard for them like don't don't give yourself up you know like you don't need to you it's really a conversation between you and yourself that what goes on the canvas it's not you know people people bring their own stories like somebody might look at these dogs and go oh my gosh that looks like my dog i'm like 
yeah. I just kind of made this. I mean, these are these are definitely look like Keith Haring dogs to me. That's where I okay. probably pulled the imagery from was Keith Haring. I didn't do it intentionally, but you know, and then there's of course there's Basquiat influence and things like that. And that's a that's I don't know what I'm where I'm going with that, but 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 let people bring in their own stories to your art sometimes and just let them talk and you don't always have to tell everybody what you're thinking. That's yeah, uh, yeah, you, you you you've honored your trauma. Like you've you accept that it's there. You don't wallow in it. It seems, and and then you've again used it as your own incentive and your own w to work out your stuff. Just just like you use video games to work out your drying time and your achievement need. You know, that's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah and I think and I think I'm guilty too of like the, with the idea of video games is it's another reality. You can just step out of who you are for a bit. Yeah. And that's kind of what painting does too, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I was going to say something else, but I forgot. I will. Yeah. I've become an Oculus addict lately, like VR and um, to oh. step into that for 25 minutes and then go back to, you know, a spreadsheet. It's so freeing because it, it in a, in a different, you know, I get all hunched over if I play video games, whereas that like really opens up, you know, all that stuff. Uh, which is uh, your your body and your shoulder girdle and all that. Um, well, great. I, I thank you for this. I want to open it up to questions. If anybody in the audience has anything they'd like to ask. Yeah. Um, you can grab that mic. That would be great, Jessica. Is that on, Scott? Just push the button. Hello, I'm Jessica. Hello. Um, I have a couple questions about your style, so I'm going to ask them all at one time so that they don't get confusing. <laughs> Good, Jessica. If you'll if you'll look at them at oh, that screen. Can you see me over here? Yeah, there oh, you there go. I am. Cool. Hello. Okay, so you, you have a very distinct style. Um, so the first question is, how did you come into that style? And then um, I know that a lot of artists, new artists, will try to focus on realism and getting it right to get facial features and stuff like that. Um, so what dra drives your abstract style? And then finally, how has sticking to that style maybe possibly challenged your customer base? Um, oh, that's good. Okay, so <laughs> I, get, I think I think the style came up um, uh, probably most likely from just the materials that were available at the time, um, the colors, the, the, you know, I was painting on cardboard. This, this painting behind me is on cardboard right now, paper. So very inexpensive um, materials. Cause like I said before, I'm cheap. So what I didn't want to do was spend a lot of money with this hobby. I wanted to kind of play where it was kind of, you know, it was more like a, a joke. Like I didn't really take it seriously. And, but I loved it. It was fun. So um, I did that. And then what I, we have an art store here in DC called uh, Utrecht, or now it's called Blick, but you guys might have, I'm not sure if you have it there, but they have really, really good paint. So I went in and bought some really, really nice red, really nice yellow, blue, stuff like that. And I found that the, the last layer was really the most important. So I would use a really expensive paint on the outside of the last layer of the paint. And then some of the other cheaper stuff would kind of you know, show through, I use um, charcoal, I use dry stuff, I use china markers, I use lumber crayons, I use pretty much everything. Anything you get at a hardware store I could use is, you know, on art. Um, so when I when I first started, I guess it was in 97 or 98 when the Basquiat movie came out, the one with um, mm -hmm. Andy Warhol, uh, not Andy Warhol, uh, David Bowie as, as Warhol. Yeah. And um, and I, I went to opening day and I, I didn't know anything about Basquiat's painting at the time, but when I saw the movie and they had the scene where the, the gallery owner goes to his apartment and sees a stack of paintings and she's flipping through and I'm like, oh my God, because I, I thought his art, his art is very primitive and mine is primitive and I thought it was very similar. Um, so then I was like, oh my God, I can do this. Um, so the thing that really probably has kept me in the style the most is because it's I find it easy and that may sound weird but I this is the easiest way for me to paint this is the easiest way for me to to do painting I, I can't do realistic paintings I don't think I mean I I've tried I when I first started I would make 
I would like get a, a photo and then I would do like a dot to dot. I would do the, I would do like a ratio of, you know, on the canvas, if this is 10 over on the, on the photograph, it was six over. So I would do like a, a matrix type thing. And then I tried to determine where the eyes would go. The nose, you know, like I didn't understand, I didn't take the classes. So I was self-taught in that respect. So I didn't know, <laughs> where, you know, where things were supposed to go. So I just kind of Try, but that took forever when I was doing dot 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 painting. So then I just went back to do an abstract, and now I just kind of listen to music on the headphones and let it go. Like just let the let the song take me. I'm still listening to stuff I listened to in high school, and I'm finding new inspiration from that still. Um, so I guess I do go kind of back in time when I paint in a weird way. Like I am trying to be that 16, 17 year old person when I paint, have that energy. And that's another thing I always tell people: if when you're younger paint everything that you feel at the at that time because my god if i could go back to what i used when i was a kid and had all that energy whew, i could i'd probably have a lot more paintings out too and i'd probably be a better painter um and then and then the ch how does it challenge my customers um i don't know i mean i guess i guess some people say that i get repetitive like so these dogs i've done thousands of these things the bowl over here and those are what I call my hits. So if you think of like a band, um, like the Rolling Stones, they probably come out with new records now or, or records, new songs. And, um, but people don't want to hear the, the new stuff. You want to hear the old stuff. So a lot of times I know I can, these are like in marketing, it's called a cash cow, I believe. Is that the right term? Yeah, where, <laughs> where you have a, a, a widget that has always been successful. That kind of is always going to sell no matter what. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's what these are for. And then I can, so that kind of every month I have a, my wife and I, we have a number that we want to hit sales. So every month, so we have a spreadsheet, of, you know, every sale, everything, every expense. And, and we have a number, the first of every month, we have 30, 31 days to hit that number. Once we hit that number, then we can relax, paint whatever we want kind of idea. So that way we know at the end of the year, we've made enough money to pay bills and do savings. Um, so that's another key to my business stuff is, is, um, is doing that. So anyways, uh, all right, customers. So pretty much I, I take requests. I take commissions also from people. So if somebody wanted a, a Christmas present for somebody, they want me to paint them with their dog. They know what's going to look like one of my paintings, but I will do requests for people. So I don't know if that makes sense. But so in other words, if somebody gets bored of yeah. my work, they go, hey, Matt, why don't you paint you know this for me? And I'll, I'll go, sure, I'll give it a shot. And the way I work that is you don't have to pay me if you don't like it. So in other words, I'll send you an email of the picture that I painted this, and if you don't like it, you don't have to buy it, but I paint it in a way that I know somebody else will buy it. So I, I do that. If, if you haven't already been to the Gordon Gallery, do stop by, it's, a, it's an amazing show. And, uh, and, and you did some commissions for this. You painted David Goode, my friend, um, uh -huh. uh, and some other folks for that. And, and some of it you did with Cole from Norfolk Southern? Yes, yes, so that's... Um, a real important thing I think with the art is whenever, so I've traveled a lot and shown in a lot of different places. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go to a, like a city or a country and I like to spend a week or two painting there and getting inspiration from the things around me where I'm painting, um, which is a great thing living here in DC, always something going on. But um, so like when I went to, to Norfolk, um, they were able to get me a, a place to paint and I was able to research, go down to the water and, you know, look at the ships and things and, and get a, a sense for the culture, the community. Um, and then Colin, the curator of the show, he was able to get me some coal um, to paint with because we, we were talking a lot about the reliance on coal um, for the economy. And um, so I thought that would be really cool to paint with coal. So I, that was the first time I ever used coal is, is for, for the show with Norfolk. So I would use that kind of as a base. And if you know the artist uh, Dubuffet, he's, um, they show his stuff here at the Smithsonian. He was a taught artist, but wanted to paint like an outsider or like a folk artist. So, but his stuff, he used a lot of sand and dirt. Um, so I went and looked at some of his work before I started working for this, for the coal stuff for this show. Um, I think his stuff is a lot better than mine. I don't know if, I don't know if my coal paintings were super successful. I think there are like three really good ones or four i don't know but it was a lot of fun it was fun i like it and, and colin was the one who got me that coal he actually went and secured it somehow and then 
shipped it overnight to me. So I got this huge box of coal in the mail. But I'm <laughs> sure if, I don't know, it was really cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Any other yeah. questions? Yes. Uh, hello. So I did go to the ODU exhibit and I thought the coal paintings were really nice, especially the the one of the the owner who helped with the connections of getting you the coal, the self portrait that they were talking about. Nice. Um, cool. And I got a uh, it was a private tour with Colin, who uh, how I found out about your exhibit. And one of the things that he mentioned was that you painted a backdrop for a play. And I've also been asked to paint alongside a performance of some sort. How was it uh, like getting those opportunities and experiences? Like, what was it like? Um, yeah, it was great. So the, both of those opportunities, and it's amazing how pretty much every opportunity like that has always been via social media, somebody just seeing my work on Facebook, or I guess that's kind of all that we've ever used. Um, and um, so, I did a play, I've done a few plays, but um, it was one like in LA where this person just found my work. This is probably about, I guess almost 20 years ago. And he just wrote me and said, hey, do you wanna come to LA, Hollywood and uh, do the backdrop for this play? Um, and I ended up sleeping in the theater and painting it all right there <laughs> on the spot, which is crazy. Uh, that's when I had more energy. and. Um, and I would watch the, the you know, the, the, the practices or what are they, I don't know if they call them practices, what do they call when you rehearsals, yeah. The <laughs> yeah, rehearsal, there you go. And, and, um, <laughs> and so anyways, I was watching that and getting more ideas for that. So I, I pretty much read the script on the plane out there. Um, the one I did one, one in the, in the show at, at ODU is, well, there's one from another play that's, that I did in San Francisco. And that was the same guy who asked me to do the thing in LA. And, um, I had like two or three days to do those and they were huge. And that, so that was I have another one where I had to sleep um, in the theater and paint on pretty much on the floor because there's, you know, it's too yeah. large. So I did all that on the floor um, and just made it up. I mean, it, it, I had just had to go with confidence and just kind of, you know, be squirrely with it and hope for the best. Um, and then there's another one in there that's from an opera I did in Raleigh, North Carolina during uh, Giovanni, the the performance, the opera performance of Giovanni, and that was another one. They they uh, they had me stay in Raleigh, North Carolina, in a um, like a storefront, uh, abandoned business, and I painted all these huge canvas on the floor uh, for the that were you know for the backdrop of the of the opera. And th this was a kind of opera where people had black ties, and it was like real professional mm -hmm. stuff which blew me away. I was like, I was just kind of like this, you know, hack painter doing this. And, um, but then during the performance, the, I think it was like two nights, I was painting while they were performing on stage. So I was just having to make up stuff then too, like using house paint and, whew, and it, it was hard. It, it, I mean, it, was, it wasn't hard, it was just kind of intimidating, but I think the idea is I get now with painting and maybe this could be some advice is I really, I think most of my work is, pretty crappy like I think if I if I have that attitude in my head that it's not serious and it's not necessarily great art or um you know then it, it gives me a freedom where I, I don't have to worry that it, that I'm making mistakes so it's almost like all art all my art is, is is mistakes and it's a series of mistakes and I don't think I'm the first one to say that I think that other artists have probably said that but oh no isn't it Bob Ross is it happy accidents yeah, so these, yeah, or yeah. happy trees, but then something about, yeah, anyway. So it's kind of that idea where, you know, the colors come together and it's kind of, then that's your painting. And once, so I always make sure you always see mine, they have the lips, the teeth, you know, maybe the circles, the eyes and the colors. So I always use that somewhere or try to use that in my painting so that, you know, it's one of mine. Um, so that would be the advice I'd give to artists or people who want to try this is just come up with some icons, come up with some things that are repetitious that you can put in all your work um, and use quality paint. Uh, that's the biggest advice I could give too, because when you start off as an artist or a painter, you're going to be in group shows a lot of times. Like you'll be in a show with, you know, 20 other people, but if you have the brightest red and the deepest colors and your yellows are better than everybody else's yellow, your, your painting from the other side of the room is going to pop so much better than theirs. You're going to tell the other people we're trying to, you know, just do the work and maybe not spend any money on it. But 
The other trick is charge less than everybody else in the room too, <clears throat> especially if you have a better looking painting or better looking art and you'll, you'll do fine. <laughs> Great. A couple more. And Okay, so you've mentioned a couple times um, kind of you're cheap and so you buy cheaper materials, um, which is something I do. I pick up a lot of my canvases at thrift stores and paint over them. Um, so how do you price your your uh, pieces to kind of keep that price down? And what's your process with that? Um, yeah, pretty much hourly. I kind of try to give myself an hourly wage. I try not to make more than a certain number in a day, like if I have a really good day and paint a lot, I try not to go overboard and <clears throat> make too, like I, I like my cheapest work now, I think is probably 30 or $40, my smalls. And I'm using, you know, I'm using paper. I'm using like, so like I'm sitting in my studio. So this is like canvas board, five by seven, get this on Amazon, you get 72 of these, I think for, for 20 bucks or something. I mean, you, you can get so many inexpensive things and then just you, you pass on the savings to your people that are collecting it. And then, um, uh, oh, another thing I didn't mention, when I ship, I always wrap stuff in butcher paper. Butcher paper, you can buy that. Like, so you can get the, the holder and the, and the rolls on Amazon. Um, so that, kind of, that makes your paintings a lot safer when you ship them and stuff. But um, so back to, yeah, so, okay, so pricing. I mean, it's pretty much, if you look at my site, like a uh, 18 or 12 inch by 18 piece of paper, probably like 120, $130, which I still think is high. But now that I'm married, I have to I have another boss that I have to run prices by. And, but anyway, she she's done, she's very wise on this stuff. Um, but we come up with, pretty much we price our stuff about the same. So we, we buy bulk canvas, um, you know, it can really, you can really get the price low. If you, uh, you guys have a Jerry's Artorama, I think at Virginia Beach there, and they have really good prices. Um, I buy a lot of canvas from them. Um, so I don't know. I mean, always buy bulk paper. You, you get stacks of like, you know, 300 sheets of good, good paper for like a hundred bucks. Um, you know, you can pay for it one painting. Was there one over here? Did you have one? No. Great. Well, um, Thank you so much for joining us today. We should probably wrap up. Um, uh, I needed this today. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's a lot about trusting your gut and your intuition and making your own rules, but also, you know, the discipline and in industry that that's required by that, you know, um, that's really beautiful to hear. And the way you've hacked your, or, or, or at least incentivized your life for yourself is, is gorgeous. Any, any parting words of wisdom for young art entrepreneurs? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, I <laughs> um, so yeah, the main thing is, that sounds, I sound like a old football coach that I used to have in high school, but always set goals, always have like a, you know, a week goal, a month goal, um, year goal, five-year goal, 10-year goal. So right now I'm working towards a 10-year goal where I'm, planning on painting for at least 10 more years before I start, you know, I'll be 65 in 10 years. So I'm trying to keep this pace until then. Um, so always have goals out there. You know, if you're, if you're 20 now, um, save your money, <laughs> um, throw it in some, uh, if you have extra here and there, put it in, put it in the you know, stocks. I don't know. That's probably not the best idea, but I know, or maybe it is. I mean, I wish I would have done that earlier, but, um, that's really the, the main one. And, um, put yourself through, through struggle. I mean, I, I was talking with Dan and my wife this morning and I, you know, I've, I've a potential another show coming up in like four or five months. And I was like, God, ah, I want to do it. And uh, but I'm like, yes, you got to put yourself through, through, through strain and, mm -hmm. and struggle in order to grow. And I mean, that's maybe why I run too. like, like add an exercise plan into your day somehow, you know, just something. Um, and that's about it. And also I'm a vegetarian, so haven't eaten meat and long time, 25, 30 years. So that's another thing I really attribute to maybe my insane <laughs> appetite for, I don't know, painting, stuff like that. That's great. <laughs> I thirst for Did blood. I haven't had meat in so long. <laughs> 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 All I'm right. so hungry. The <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Stay hungry. I guess that's that yeah. It? There you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you so much for your time right. today and uh, and for your work. It's really a joy to enter that space and spend some time with it. So thank you for all oh, you're you, putting bro. out, all, all your right. good vibes and um and your good taste of music. So, all right. Thank you very much. I, pre I appreciate everybody listening and send me an email anytime if you have any questions or complaints. Cool. Thank you. Right. Oh, and uh, Bye -bye. he's painting live tomorrow, right? On YouTube? Oh, yeah. Painting live tomorrow. Um, if go you go to, to YouTube and just type in Matt Ciso, it'll pop up. Um, it's, yeah. that it's coming soon or whatever. That's probably the fastest way to get there. Um, and a quick Google search will get you to mattciso.com. And uh, yep. Or just and, email me. Yeah. Yep. yep. Cool. All right. Thanks. Have a good afternoon.